Hello everyone, Darren Alf here from BicycleTouringPro.com. How are you? I'm in the uh, Bicycle Touring Pro headquarters here in my home in Park City, Utah, um, drinking tea, chamomile tea, out of the Bicycle Touring Pro coffee cup. And it's a beautiful day here in Park City. Uh, where are you guys? Leave a comment. Let me know where you are in the world. Um, be, it's always fun when I'm doing one of these broadcasts because people tune in from all around the world. So um, let me know where you are. Leave a comment. Can you hear me okay as well? Can you hear me? Can you see me? Um, if you can see me, you might see that I'm wearing the Bicycle Touring Pro fully loaded touring bicycle t-shirt. This is available in the Bicycle Terrain store at bicycleterrainpro.com forward slash shop. Um, it's also available at biketourshop.com. But this is the best selling t shirt in the entire shop right now. And as you can see, it features a fully loaded touring bicycle with front and rear panniers, three water bottles, and the words Bicycle Touring Pro underneath. Um, this is the most popular shirt in the store. There's several other shirts in there. The wild camping shirt is also extremely popular. And there is a new bike packing shirt, very similar to this one. It features a bike packing bicycle, but it says the word bike packing underneath it. So if you're into bike packing, check out that shirt as well. I personally really like the red long sleeve bike packing shirt. I think that's a really cool one. Um, it's kind of like burgundy red. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. I see everyone uh, coming on here and people are starting to ask questions. I will answer questions in just a moment. I just wanted to kind of, one, introduce myself for those of you who don't know who I am, and two, give people some time so that uh, they can kind of join the broadcast and, uh, and figure out what's going on here. So I'm just going to stall for just a moment and then we will begin the live webinar today. Thank you guys so much uh, for tuning in. So, one second. Uh, yeah, this is the Bicycle Train Pro coffee cup. It features a guy leaning his bike up against a tree with a campfire, the tent, there's a waterfall, mountains, trees, the idyllic bicycle train situation basically, and it's printed on both sides of the cup. And um, this is another popular seller in the store. Um, but today I'm drinking chamomile tea out of my cup. And I'll be talking to you guys today, answering any of your questions that you might have about bicycle travel and also talking about the current situation of bike travel with this uh, illness that shall not be named. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we'll talk about all of that. And, and like I said, I'll give you guys the opportunity to ask me any questions that you want about bicycle touring, world travel, lifestyle design. I'll be talking about what I've been doing recently during this whole situation and maybe giving you some tips for things that you can do as well, even though at the moment we aren't being encouraged to travel the world in the way that uh, we may have done previously. So with that being said, let me just introduce myself for those who don't know who I am. My name is Darren Alf and I am the Bicycle Touring Pro. Back in 2001, I was 17 years old, and I had this crazy idea of riding my bike from Oregon to Mexico down the California coastline. And at the time, I didn't know anything about bicycle touring. I didn't even know that was a word. Um, I didn't know anybody that had done a long distance bike tour like that, and there really weren't very many resources out there for people who wanted to travel long distances by bike. So I did my first bike tour in 2001, successfully cycling from Oregon to Mexico down the California coastline. The following year, I cycled across America from east to west. Uh, the following year after that, I cycled up the east coast from North Carolina to Maine. The year after that, I cycled from Chicago to New Orleans, kind of following the Mississippi River, crisscrossing over the river. The year after that, I cycled across um, kind of like northwestern, uh, the northwestern United States, uh, Idaho and Wyoming, Utah, uh, Washington. I went up into Canada, uh, back down to Oregon, uh, completed cycling the entire Pacific coastline and saw my first bit of international cycling in Canada. And then after that, 
I started cycling internationally, traveling overseas. I, I first went to Europe, then I went to Africa, then I went to South America, then I went to Asia, then back to uh, Europe, and then back to South America. And I've basically spent the last 20 years cycling all around the world on my bicycle or on several different bicycles. And on that note, just this past week, um, I released a new podcast on the Bicycle Touring Pro podcast. Um, Bicycle Touring Pro has not only a website, but a popular YouTube channel as well as a podcast. So if you aren't subscribed to all three of those things, I highly recommend you do that. On the Bicycle Touring Pro website, I have a free email newsletter that will teach you how to conduct your own bike tours anywhere in the world, give you a whole bunch of free advice um, there. I have the free Bicycle Touring Pro YouTube channel, uh, which has currently about 700 videos, I think, six or 700 videos on there, um, some of which are just for pure entertainment, uh, where you can see me and other people uh, traveling around the world on their bicycles. And some of the other videos are like how-to videos that will teach you how to conduct your own bike tours. And then finally, I have the free Bicycle Touring Pro podcast. And just this last week, I was uh, interviewed, or just recently, I should say, I was interviewed for another podcast called Tell Me About Your Bike. And so I was the featured guest on the Tell Me About Your Bike podcast. And on that podcast, I talked about the first bicycle that I ever really owned, which was a Schwinn Sierra mountain bike. And that is the bike that I used. It was like, it was a bike built in 1980 or something like that, like the very early 80s. Old bike and not designed for long distance touring at all. But that's the bike that I used for my first two bicycle tours. And if you listen to that podcast, the Tell Me About Your Bike podcast uh, with me or the latest episode of the Bicycle Touring Pro podcast, you will hear the story of my first bicycle uh, how that bike got run over by a car, how I hammered the bike out and continued to cycle that bike across America. So you have to listen to the podcast to hear the whole story, but that bike definitely has some stories behind it. So I highly encourage you to check out the new and latest episode of the Bicycle Touring Pro podcast. And if you aren't already subscribed to the podcast, I recommend you do that because um, I'm coming out with new episodes all the time, and once you you are subscribed to the podcast, you'll be notified each and every time a new episode comes out. So um, check it out. I highly encourage you to do that. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. I see all your questions. I'll answer them in just a moment. Um, give me a second here, but thank you. I see hi from Ukraine, several people from Ukraine, which is awesome. Have you ever gone to Taiwan? Yes, I spent two months in Taiwan cycling there. Um, great place for cycling. Hated the food in Taiwan, though. Um, I, I had a hard time finding food as a vegetarian, although there were some, there was some food, but anyways, um, hello from Ontario. Hello from Glasgow, Scotland. Hello from Bristol, UK. Um, hello from Santa Clarita, California. Um, <laughs> Cambridge, hello from Cambridge, England, Slovenia, hello from Germany, Deutschland, um, uh, okay, you guys can hear me, that's good, um, hello from the Netherlands, hello from Poland, Dzień dobry, jak się uh, hello from San Diego, hello from sunny southern Sweden, awesome, thank you guys so much for tuning in, so, um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I will answer you guys' questions in just a moment, but first I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the coronavirus and what's going on there and how that's affected bicycle touring at the moment. Now, what I will tell you is that normally at this time of year, it's May, late May, um, but for the last several months, usually like March, April, May, um, those are usually my biggest months as the bicycle touring pro. Those are the months where most people are getting ready for their bicycle tours and I'm in the process of helping people plan, prepare for, and execute their own bicycle touring adventures all around the world. This year, the world kind of ground to a halt because of this illness that has been going around and, and has totally uh, brought the world to a stop in many ways. 
And so I have definitely felt the impact of this situation as the bicycle train pro. Um, not only from a, you know, just a website owner standpoint, like my traffic is down, the number of emails that I'm getting every day is down, um, the number of views on my videos and my podcasts are down, all of that because people just aren't thinking about traveling by bike right now. They got other things on their mind, which I understand. It's unfortunate, but I understand it. The other thing that's gone on that negatively for me is that I had a bunch of bike tours planned this year. I was going to go to Portugal. I was going to be riding in the Bike Virginia tour again, which is that epic bike ride I did on the east coast of the United States last year. I was really looking forward to that. Um, I had some other bike tours planned. I was considering going to Morocco. Um, all of this got canceled and or, or postponed, perhaps. Um, until when, I don't know, but um, that is the situation at the moment for me. So I have basically moved back into my home. Um, when I was 22 years old, I bought a condo in the resort town of Park City, Utah. And there's a whole story behind this, and I'm, I'm going to tell it because I think it might be beneficial to someone out there. Because I think me moving from Southern California when I was, I don't know, 20-something years old to Utah and buying this condominium when I was 22 years old is perhaps one of the best things that I've ever done in my entire life besides maybe some of the bike tours that I've done. Um, buying this condo is probably one of the most financially intelligent things that I've ever done. Um... Let me tell you the story of what I was doing when I was 22 years old, because I went to film school and I spent four years studying filmmaking and audio. I was basically studying editing and sound uh, when I was in film school. And so I wasn't on like the, the cinematography side. I was more on the editing and audio side of things. That's what I wanted to go into, and I, and I really had this goal of making documentaries when I got out of film school. That was what I wanted to do. So I was going to film school for four years, and every summer I would ride my bike across America in one different direction during my summer break, and then I would go back to university, study some more, work some more. I had two jobs um, working on the university campus when I was in university, and and then summer would hit again and I'd go off on another big long bike tour. So that's how I kind of like squeezed in my education, my work, and this fun thing that I was doing, bicycle touring at the time. After I graduated from university, I it only took me about two weeks to get a job in Hollywood and it was just a short job. I was kind of working temporarily for small gigs, so I was jumping from uh, commercials to short films to things like that, you know, just whatever job I could possibly get, basically. And I was mostly working as a sound mixer. And for those of you who don't know what a sound mixer is, a sound mixer is the guy on the set of a movie who's basically in charge of capturing all of the audio for the movie. And mostly you're trying to get the audio from the actors. So you're trying to get good dialogue, good audio from the key actors that are appearing on the screen. And one of the first films that I did was a uh, period piece. I'm, I'm not gonna tell you the name of it because it, I don't want you even to like seek it out, but it was, was kind of like a gangster film. And it was about these children of gangsters who uh, started like taking after their father's ways, kind of like their fathers were gangsters and then these kids see what their fathers are doing and uh, kind of emulate them in some very bad ways. So that was the film that I was working on. And like I said, it was a period piece. So it was set back in like the 1920s or something like that. I can't even remember. But we had this old, a bunch of old cars that we were shooting on set. And one of the cars was like a, you know, one of these Ford Model T cars, like a really old car. And they make a lot of noise. And also we were shooting in the rain. So um, rain, 
an old car that makes a lot of noise. And here I am. My job is to uh, get good audio from the actors as they're speaking inside this car, driving down the road with rain falling on top of the car. It was a very, very difficult job. But I apparently did a good job because um, after after that film was finished, I started getting other jobs in the film industry, um, and they almost all had something to do with cars. I was I was like the car audio guy. There was a movie, um, or I forget what it was, but it was some project I was working on where it was a large part of the movie took place in a taxi. And so I had to ride along. I had to rig this taxi with all these microphones and get the actors set up. And then I would ride along in the back, in the trunk of the car. Uh, I was in the trunk of the car as this car is driving around and the actors are in the front. And I'm mixing audio in the back with a flashlight and all my gear in there. It was really hot and sweaty and everything. So anyways, that's kind of like what I was doing before I started Bicycle Terrain Pro. And then when I was... 22 years old, I had like a week off of work and I decided to to drive up to Utah to look at some properties because not only did I go to film school, but I also studied business. And um, I had read like hundreds of business books and I wanted to buy a house up in Utah, not to live in, but just to rent out and make passive income from, you know, buy this place for 200000 or something and sit on it for 10 years and maybe it'll be worth 300,000 um in the you know by the time that's over. So I, I drove up to Utah and I looked at a bunch of houses none of which really like appealed to me so much. But then I uh drove up to Park City, Utah, which is a resort town just above Salt Lake City or just above Provo, Utah. And I wasn't really looking at buying a property here initially, because I knew it was a resort town, and I knew it was very expensive. It's the most expensive city in the entire state. And I got here, and I was like, screw the rental property. I am moving here. This is the most amazing city I've ever been to. Um, it's so outdoorsy. There's like 300 miles of bike tracks, single track and, and bike paths and all that kind of stuff, just, just in the center of Park City alone, not to mention all the bike trails outside of the city. So I I pull into town. I go into a realtor. At the time, believe it or not, I had bleach blonde hair. Like, I, I looked like a member of NSYNC or something like that. And, uh, and like I said, I was 22 years old, went into this realtor in a very high-end resort town, and I said, can you show me some properties here in town that I can possibly afford? She showed me three different properties very, very quickly. And then I drove home back to California and I told my parents about my trip and the houses I had looked at. And I said, I want to move to Park City. I don't know what I could do there, um, you know, but I, I'm thinking of quitting my job, move to Park City, and I'll figure it all out once I get there. And so that's exactly what I did. Um, two days later, I called the realtor that had shown me the properties here in Utah. And I said, you know, that first condo that you showed me, I want it. Let's put in an offer. And the offer was accepted. I bought the, the condo. I moved. I quit my job in California. I moved to Park City, Utah a month later. Moved into my condo. I had no furniture, nothing. Um, I had no job, no friends, no family, no way of paying for this condo anymore. And I had to figure out what I was going to do. And um, this is when I started Bicycle Touring Pro. This is the time when I was like, well, I've always said that I kind of like wanted to get paid to travel the world and ride my bicycle and help other people. And so that's when I started Bicycle Touring Pro. And, and obviously the, the, the business wasn't successful from the very beginning. I think my first month I made about $3.00. Um, but, uh, things have gone well ever since I've been working on bicycle train pro now for 14 years, I believe, um, approaching 15 years. And yeah, uh, since that time I've, since I started bicycle train pro, not even to mention like what I was doing before then, but since I've started bicycle train pro, I've cycled across 
I think about 70 different countries. Um, I have written four books about bicycle touring. My most popular of which is this one, The Bicycle Touring Blueprint. It's a 400 page guidebook that teaches you how to conduct your own bike tours. But I've also written several other smaller books like Stretching for Cyclists, The uh, Essential Guide to Touring Bicycles, and a book called Winter Cycling, which is all about riding your bike during the cold, wet, rainy months of winter. So, um, anyways, to make a long story short, I bought this, this condo when I was 22 years old, and I did live here for a little while, but you know, just like when I was in college, I, I would um, live here for a while, then I'd go off on a bike tour for a few months, come back, go off on a bike tour for a few months, come back. So I have now owned my condo here in Park City, Utah for 14 years. Believe it or not, that's crazy. Um, and just this January, I paid off my condo completely, uh, which I'm very proud of. Um, so I paid off my condo 16 years early. Um, I, I had a 30-year mortgage on the place, but I paid it off 16 years early. And, and the reason I wanted to tell you that is I wanted to tell you how I managed to pay the pl place off 16 years early. So that maybe you could do something similar for yourself. And the, the main way that I did this, here's my big secret, is that when I was traveling the world on my bicycle, I rented out my condo. Now... This was very easy for me to do because I now live in a very high demand place, a very high end resort town. Uh, a lot of people come here and want to work or live here or even just come on vacation. So it's very, very easy to rent a place out, especially a place that's kind of small. My place is just a one bedroom, one bath condo. Um, so uh, as far as finding renters that are looking for something affordable, um, this is a very in-demand property. So that's my first tip for you is if you buy something, you want to live in a place that other people want to be and you want to probably be on the lower end of things. You know, it's harder to rent a million dollar home than it is to rent something that's worth a quarter million dollars or something. So, um, yeah, so that's my first tip. Uh, because my property is so in-demand and so low-priced, this property has never been empty for more than like four days um, since I've owned it. So I've had dozens of renters over the years and um, it's never been empty for more than four days at a time. The, the main way that I paid off the condo early, and this is my biggest tip for you, is to rent out your property while you're gone and continue paying on your property as though you were living there. So when you rent out your home, your renters hopefully are paying your rent uh, or your mortgage, right? So that's that was the case with me. Um, when I bought this place, I would rent it out for basically what it cost me to live there. I wasn't making a profit really. I was just uh, renting it out to pay the mortgage and that's it. So break even, break even. But if you're lucky and if you're smarter than I am, you could buy a property where you're actually renting it for more than what your mortgage um, actually is. And that's what I would recommend you do. If I were to buy another property in the future, I would look for a property that I could rent out for more than what I bought it for. So what I was doing basically is I would go off sometimes for years at a time, rent out my condo, and those renters are making my mortgage payment. They're paying down you know, my loan on the property and I was out there on the road continuing to work while I was traveling and I was continuing to pay my mortgage just as though I were living in the property, even though I wasn't. So I was basically doing double payments on my mortgage for the last 14 years. And that's how I was able to reduce um, the amount of time that I spent paying off my total loan. Um, so that's my big tip for you. Um, if you want to do something like I did, travel the world for a bit, even if you just go for a few months or something, it's, it's so much better to have somebody in your property paying that rent, um, you know, getting a check for $1,000 or $2,000 or whatever your mortgage payment is, um, than to have your property sit there empty for months 
and you having to just pay the, the property yourself. So that was my big secret to paying off my property 16 years early is that I got good renters in my property. Um, I bought a property in a high demand area and that was on the lower end of properties in town. And I continued to pay on my property as though I was actually living there. So many of you have probably watched my Bicycle Train Pro videos where I'm kind of like bitching and complaining about the prices of camping or something or hotels wherever I'm staying part of my my complaining was the fact that like I'm like okay yeah maybe I'm staying in a hotel in Taiwan for $40 a night which doesn't seem like a whole lot for a hotel stay but in the back of my mind I knew that I was also paying a certain amount of money per month to pay off my condo back home so it's like yeah like you guys saw me complaining over $40, but in my mind, I'm thinking, well, actually, I'm paying $40 on my place back home, plus this $40 that I'm having to spend on the road as well. So now I'm paying $80 to sleep out here on the road, and that's why I'm, I've been such a complainer in some of my previous videos. Now, now that my condo is paid off, I still have expenses. Like, I, it's not free to live in a place even after you pay it off. You still have to pay property taxes. You still got to pay insurance. I have HOA fees, which are quite significant, um, hundreds of dollars per month, um, which helps to pay for the, the maintenance of the property, snow removal, trash, uh, mail, uh, internet, TV. I have a, there's a swimming pool and two tennis courts, a volleyball court, jacuzzi, clubhouse, all that kind of stuff is included in the HOA fee. So even though I've got my pace, place paid off now, there are still hundreds of dollars that I'm having to pay to live in this property. But those hundreds of dollars is significantly less than what I imagine most people in this city are paying to live here. Um, this city where I live, the average cost of a home here is about $2.2 million. So you can imagine um, what kind of uh, expenses those sorts of people are paying per month if they're living in a $2.2 million home. And there's several homes here in town that are $10 million, $15 million, $20 million, $25 million. Um, and there may only be one or two people living in those homes. So anyways, enough about all of that. Let's talk about bicycle touring a little bit and the state of the coronavirus and, and how that's affecting everything right now. For me, like I said, the reason I told you that whole story is, is because I have decided to come home. I have not been back here in Park City, Utah. I've not lived in my condo for the last six and a half years. And the reason is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the reason is because I went on a two-year-long bike tour across Europe and Asia. I was just sh just shy of two years. I think it was 19 months or something like that. I cycled across 14 countries in that time. And when I came back from that bike tour, I, I went to stay with my parents for the holidays, for like Thanksgiving and Christmas. And when I did that, I found out that I had cancer. So I immediately went in for surgery. I had a, a emergency cancer surgery where they cut me open and I basically spent the following five months in bed, in my house, doing nothing at all. Um, I was just trying to get healthy again. Then I j one day just jumped out of bed, booked a flight to Europe and started biking across Europe. And that was the bike tour that I did in Portugal France, uh, Spain, Andorra uh, with Kevin, my friend Kevin. And that was a very difficult bike tour for me. I was in a terrible state physically and mentally because I hadn't ridden my bike for five months. And uh, I just was not in the right mind space for bike touring, to be honest. And I think you, if you watch those videos, you could see that at times. Um, yeah. So, and, and I've basically spent the last six, so six and a half years now, I've spent um, either bike touring around the world or back at my parents' house in Southern California dealing with my cancer stuff. Because the thing about having cancer is once you get cancer, 
You have to constantly go in for checks and rechecks and more checks and doctor visits and all kinds of stuff. So when I first got cancer, I was having to come back to Southern California every three months to see my doctors and get new tests done, CT scans and blood tests and all kinds of stuff. Um, and they would check, check in my hormone levels and everything. Um, and so three months is not a lot of time. You know, I'm used to being on the road for months at a time and going off on these epic adventures. I went to Peru for six months. You know, I rode across Europe for 14 months. Um, I spent three months in Africa, you know. Um, and, and so for me to go home, do all my cancer treatment stuff, and then squeeze in a bike tour in between having to come back again, to Southern California was very, very difficult for me, but I did end up doing that. I cycled across Ecuador and Colombia. I cycled across Europe several times. I spent a lot more time in Europe than I probably wanted to spend in Europe, um, but I I felt safer in Europe um, than I did in a lot of other places. You know, going to the Amazon was probably not one of the best decisions that I've ever made just because I was so far out there. And if something had happened to me, regarding my cancer or or just you know i get hit by a car or something um i just wasn't in the mental or physical state at that time to deal with it so um these last few six years for me or i guess four and a half years having cancer now um have not been a lot of fun i've tried to get in as much bike touring as i possibly can um i think some of my bike tours that i did like my trip to alaska was a complete failure um, because I had just some things going on with me that um, prevented me from doing the tours like I normally would have done. It's unfortunate, but um, I've tried to press on. And I think even though maybe some of my own personal bike tours have not been as successful as I've wanted them to be, I have been able to continue to help other people uh, conduct their own bicycle tours. And I've been very successful in that endeavor. If you check out the success stories on the Bicycle Touring Pro website, um, go to BicycleTouringPro.com. Up at the top, the header, there's a button that says success stories. And you will see photos and videos and testimonials from my Bicycle Touring Pro readers all around the world talking about uh, the help that I have given them through my website, through the videos, through the podcast, whatever, um, and how they have managed to take my information and go off and conduct their own incredible bicycle touring adventures all around the world. So I'm very, very proud of that. Um, and I hope to continue to do that in the future with you guys and with hundreds and thousands of other people from all around the world. So what is the situation with um, this illness going around right now? What I have heard from so many people bike touring around the world right now is basically their plans are on hold. People are now starting to plan future bike tours. Um, I have noticed, excuse me, I've noticed a recent uptick in uh, traffic. I've wrote, noticed a recent uptick in the number of emails that I'm receiving. Um, all of a sudden, as the world has started to open again, I think people are starting to think about getting out on their bikes. Um, and, and maybe if people aren't thinking about riding around the world right now, um, people are still thinking about at least doing something locally. And, and that's where I am kind of at the moment. Like I said, all of my international travel plans for this year have been canceled or postponed until next year, perhaps. I don't really know. Um, so my plan is to stay here at home, which I'm very happy to do. I haven't been here for, for such a long time. And I'm planning to do some local bike tours here in the state of Utah and maybe in some of the states around me. I am very fortunate because I happen to live in what I believe is one of the most beautiful parts of the United States and possibly one of the most beautiful uh, places in the entire world. I've got forests and deserts and mountains and lakes and rivers and streams and all kinds of, you know, uh, varying degrees of weather um, and terrain to share with you. So I'm hoping this summer and this autumn to get out and to do some uh, pretty cool, epic uh, mini bike tours, perhaps, in the state of Utah and in these surrounding areas, maybe Wyoming, Idaho, etc., Colorado, perhaps. 
So stay tuned for that. Um, I look forward to sharing all of that with you. And um, all I have to say otherwise is that, yeah, I don't think this is going to last forever. You know, I do think things will return to normal at some point. Um, if you are thinking about a bike tour, I encourage you to continue thinking about it. Um, a lot of my people who buy my book, The Bicycle Turn Blueprint, or go to my website, bicycleturnpro.com, a lot of those people, they don't just jump up one day and go on a bike tour. Like they think about it for quite a while and it takes some time. You got to get a bike and you got to get the gear and you got to figure out what you're going to pack and you got to plan your route and you got to find people to ride with. So some people take three months, six months, 12 months even to plan and prepare for their bicycle tours. And that's what this book is designed to help you do so that you don't waste a whole bunch of time and money, um, you know, buying the wrong gear or, um, you know, wasting time on things that basically you don't need to be doing. Um, that This is the book that will help you kind of plan your own adventures. Um, so if, if you want to buy this book, it's on the website, bicycleturnpro.com, um, and it's in the shop, bike tour shop. Com. I highly recommend this. It comes in paperback like this, um, but it also comes in an ebook format. So if you want to save a little bit of money, you can get it in ebook format. I recommend the paperback, even though it is a little bit more expensive, but there are worksheets in here um, that like I encourage you to write in the book and make notes on. Like here's a packing list. So it's I think it's very useful to have this book at home with you before you leave the road. Here's one of the worksheets where I kind of like ask you to write in some of your own answers to questions, prompts, um, you know, um, I'm, in this particular prompt, I'm, I'm asking the reader, how are you going to get your bicycle, your gear and yourself to the start of your bike tour? What are you going to do with your bike box or case once you reach your starting location? How are you going to get your bicycle, your gear and yourself home at the end of your bike tour. So in that chapter, I'm talking about the transportation to and from the start of a bike tour, because a lot of people don't just start and finish their bike tours from home, but they travel to a far off destination with their bike and then bike back home, or they bike to some other destination and then travel back home. So there's all kinds of worksheets and stuff in this book. Um, I highly recommend you pick this up if you haven't done so already and you're thinking about a future bike tour. Okay, let's answer some questions, shall we? Let me go back and I'm going to see what kind of questions we got here. Hold on. Um, sorry, there's a whole bunch. And if I missed you, uh, let me apologize. I'll apologize in advance, but just keep answering and asking questions and I'll try to answer as much as I can. So someone said, did you reschedule your trip to Australia? I never had a trip to Australia planned. I was going to New Zealand, however, which is close to Australia. And yeah, um, I had to cancel that trip as well, unfortunately. That was not due to the coronavirus situation. That was actually due to uh, um, some of this, uh, the problems that I've been having regarding my cancer. Um, I, I had a crazy incident happen to me when I was flying back from Ukraine uh, just a couple months ago at the like beginning of December. And I was supposed to fly to New Zealand at the end of December. So I had this crazy thing. I don't even really want to talk about it. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you some other time because that's a whole other story. But basically I had something happen to me health-wise and I had to cancel my trip to New Zealand. So hopefully um, I'll get back there at some point. I was really looking forward to that trip, but golly, um, I was bummed that that did not happen. Someone, Michelle says, earplugs. I don't use earplugs. I don't carry them on my bike tours, but it's such a lightweight thing. If you want to pack them, go ahead, go right ahead. Um, you know, um, I don't like sleeping with earplugs in because I like to hear what's going on around me, especially when I'm camping. Um, I just feel like it's a safety thing. Like if there's a person or a bear or something outside my tent, I want to know that. I don't want to be just fast asleep and totally surprised by it. So for me, I don't like earplugs, but um, like I said, it's such a small lightweight thing. If you want to bring them, do it. Um, let's see. 
Leslie says, in your years in Europe, what is the most bicycle-friendly country for bike paths, etc.? Well, I would say, right off the top of my head, I think the Netherlands is probably one of the most bicycle-friendly countries. They have bike paths going everywhere, and the Netherlands is crazy flat. So cycling in the Netherlands is probably like one of the easiest things that I've ever done in my entire life. Like as far as bike tours go, the Netherlands is a piece of freaking cake. Uh, that being said, I found cycling in the Netherlands to be somewhat boring uh, just because it was so easy, maybe. Um, I enjoyed it for like the first couple days but after a while like I, I don't know it just i was just bored and and honestly i think belgium is a much more exciting place to cycle than the netherlands i think belgium which is so close i mean you could do the netherlands and belgium in the same trip if you wanted to but belgium has excellent bike paths as well uh not as they aren't as good as in the netherlands i don't think across the whole country but Belgium, especially Western Belgium, has a lot of great bike paths. Western Belgium is flat, and Eastern Belgium is hillier, and they don't have as many good bike paths. That being said, I liked Belgium. I liked Eastern Belgium, too. Um, even though it's hilly, it was very, very beautiful. And so if you're looking for, like, a beginner place to start out, especially in Europe... I would recommend the Netherlands and Belgium and maybe doing both of those countries in the same tour if you possibly can. You could do both both of those countries in two weeks, see a large part of those two countries and cover a whole lot of ground and um, have an incredible time. So that's what I would recommend probably as a beginner place to go, a place that has great bike paths, a place that's going to be safe. Um, and a place that you will come home from having some incredible memories. So, yeah, that's what I would recommend. But there's so many other good places in the world to bike, too. It's, it, you know, Europe especially. Europe is just, in my mind, the epicenter of the world for bicycle touring. It's hard to find uh, a better part of the world to cycle than in Europe. There's just so many countries, so many good bike paths, so many little backcountry roads, you know. That's that's the thing about, uh, you know, I've cycled across South America and Africa and, and Asia and stuff. The problem with so many of those countries is that y when you're cycling long distances in those countries, you're oftentimes riding on major roads with a whole bunch of cars, maybe not a big shoulder. And and same here in America, North America, you know. If you, if you want to bike across the country, it's pretty much inevitable that you're going to be cycling on a highway or a freeway at some point along your journey um, there's just no way around it so that's where i feel like europe really has an advantage is even if you're not on a dedicated bike path um, you could be on a little back road or a farm road or something like that forest road um, that gets you away from a whole lot of the traffic um Sabur forever. I don't know if <laughs> that's the way you say it, but it says, I never figured out if you use SPD cycling shoes, do you? So I have been bike touring around the world for 20 years. And in that time, I have used SPD cycling shoes, which are like shoes that clip into your pedals. For those of you who don't know what those are, um, they basically have clips on the bottom that clip into your pedals so that you can kind of, your, your foot is more secure on the pedal. You don't have this big risk of your pedal slipping off as you're cycling downhill at high speed. Um, you can also pull up on the pedal because you're clipped into the pedal. You're not only just pushing down on the pedal like you would if you were cycling in tennis shoes or something, but you can also pull up on the, on the pedals as well, which um, just, I don't know, gives you perhaps a little bit more power, um, but it, it just allows you to pedal in a slightly different way. So SPD shoes are great, and I do cycle in SPD shoes on most of my bike tours. I would say that 70% of my bicycle touring adventures have involved me riding in a pair of SPD shoes with a pair of SPD uh, clips, pedals, on my bicycle. That being said, 
30% of my bike tours, I had just worn a regular pair of hard sole shoes, tennis shoes, hiking, like a low cut hiking shoe, something like that. So if you watched my bike tour uh, from 2017, when I biked up to the Nord Cap in Norway, I cycled across Norway, Sweden, Finland. If you watch that video from that bike tour, you'll see that I'm just wearing a pair of shoes they're like almost like hiking shoes like low cut hiking shoes that i got from decathlon in romania and um they aren't cycling specific shoes at all they're just kind of like outdoorsy little shoes and i decided to wear those shoes on that particular bike tour because i was already carrying a lot of gear like i because i knew it was it was like a winter time bike tour i was going up above the arctic circle there was snow um it was very cold every day so i was carrying snow pants a snow jacket winter gloves a face mask beanie all this winter gear plus all my regular camera gear camping gear cooking gear regular clo cycling clothes etc etc and i was just trying to figure out a way to eliminate weight because usually when i am carrying a pair of spd cycling shoes i also carry a pair of just regular shoes to walk around in some people carry sandals to walk around in. I'm not a sandals person. I wish I was because sandals are a whole lot lighter than a second pair of shoes. But um, on that particular bike tour, I just decided to risk it uh, by going with one single pair of shoes. And, and I knew it was a risk because if my shoes got wet, I could have been in very big trouble. And they did get wet at times, but I was able to warm them up, dry them out with a fire or just by keeping them in my tent at night. So, um, that's a call that you have to make on a bike tour by bike tour basis. And that's one of the things that I, I say first thing inside this book is that every bike tour is different. And the bike you ride, the gear you pack, the clothes you wear, the shoes you put on your feet, all of that, you know, the choices that you make depend very much on the bike tour that you're conducting. So if you're riding up above the Arctic Circle and it's snowing, that's going to be a very different bike tour than if you're going to Africa and riding on dirt roads in, you know, 100 degree weather. So every bike tour is different. And that's why I have different types of bicycles. That's why I have different gear. That's why I have different clothing. And that's why I have different shoes as well. So I don't like to tell people like you should be wearing SPD shoes. Um, I encourage people to try them in my book, but if you don't like them, um, you don't have to stick with them. So there, uh, question, do you ever use a backpack on a bike ride? The answer to this is no, no, no. And yes. So again, this is something that I talk about inside the bicycle train blueprint. I talk about the various ways that you can carry your gear on a bicycle tour. And the main three ways that people carry their gear are with pannier bags, like you see on the cover of this book. These are called pannier bags. They're backpack size bags that kind of attach to the front and back of your bicycle. Those are probably the most popular way that road tourists, people cycling on the road, are carrying their gear. Then you could choose to carry your equipment in a set of, of bike packing bags. Bike packing bags are like these lightweight, um, more aerodynamic bags that, that attach to the frame or saddle or seat post of your bicycle. And bike packing bags are becoming more and more popular for long distance bike touring. Um, so that's another way that you can pack. And then you can also pack your items in a trailer which is like a one or two wheel device that you pull behind your bicycle. And there's advantages and disadvantages to each one of those three packing methods. Now, the fourth way that you could carry your gear on a bike tour is in a backpack. Like you could have a big old backpacking style backpack and you could put that backpack on your back and ride your bike. But in my book, The Bicycle Turn Blueprint, I recommend highly recommend and basically say that you should never carry anything in a backpack 
on a long distance bike tour. Now, there are exceptions to that. You could carry some light stuff, perhaps in a small backpack on your back. You could carry a camel pack on your back, which is like, you know, those hydration packs or something like that. That's fine. But I would never recommend somebody carry a giant, like backpacking size backpack on their on a long distance bike tour. If you're doing a short bike tour, one or two days, maybe that'll work, you know what I mean? But if you're going for a week, two weeks, month, year, there is no way you wanna be carrying a whole bunch of weight on your back as you're riding your bicycle. The advantage to carrying your stuff in panniers like this, uh, or carrying your things in a trailer or in a set of bike packing bags, is that the weight of this gear is on your bicycle and not on your body. That is the huge disadvantage of using a backpack is the fact that that weight of whatever you choose to carry is pressing down on your body all day long as you're riding your bike. And if you use a big heavy backpack on a bike tour, you're gonna become hot, sweaty, and sore. And you're probably gonna wanna quit your bike tour prematurely. And I've heard about people doing this, you know, uh, rejecting my advice using a backpack and quitting their bike tour after two days because they just couldn't take it anymore. The other downside to using a backpack, especially if you're using a big backpack, is that many, like when, when you're back, when you are backpacking, which is, a, by the way, a great way to train for a, a long distance bike tour is to do a backpacking trip because so much of the equipment and the techniques of like packing up your tent and moving on and mapping out a long distance route and and uh, you know packing food and enough food and water with you all of those uh, strategies that you would use for backpacking are are useful when you're bicycle touring so I I do recommend and it's something I talk about inside the blueprint I do recommend doing some backpacking if you've never done it before that's a great way to train for a bicycle tour um, but but I'm just continuing with this whole backpack thing because I get this question so often. A lot of the problem with using a big backpack like a backpacking backpack is when you're backpacking, um, oftentimes those backpacks will come up to your head uh, or even over your head sometimes. And that's fine when you're backpacking because you're walking upright and all that gear is behind you. But when you ride a bicycle, you're leaning forward like this right? You're leaning forward on your handlebars and your head is tilted up slightly. And if you have a big backpack back here, you can't lift your head up. So you are now riding with a whole bunch of weight pressing on your back, pressing on the back of your head, and you're riding your bike and you, you literally cannot lift your head up. So your head is going to cramp. You're going to be in so much pain. It's a terrible thing. I do not recommend it. So that is my big uh, answer to your question about do I recommend using a backpack? Um, my answer is no, 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 but possibly yes. And um, <laughs> if you have looked at any of my recent packing uh, lists on bicycletrainpro.com, I have tons of packing lists on there that you can use as templates for your own bicycle train adventures. So I highly recommend you look at those if you haven't done so already. There are packing lists inside the blueprint as well for different types of bicycle tours. Um, but uh, but yeah, um, what was I saying? The, one of the things you'll notice is if you look at my packing list, I sometimes carry a small lightweight backpack with me inside one of my panniers. I don't have it on my back. I just have it inside one of these bags. And the reason I bring a backpack like that is because um, I oftentimes spend a lot of time off of my bicycle. So I ride, you know, I'm riding across South America, let's say. I check into a hotel in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, and then I want to walk around town and explore. So I want to bring my camera, I want to bring some food, I want to bring some water, I want to bring my wallet, and, and so that's when I use my little travel backpack um, to walk around town and, and see the city and stuff. So I do oftentimes bring a backpack on my travels. And there's a product, by the way, 
on the Bicycle Touring Pro store, in the Bicycle Touring Pro store. And it's an adapter so that you can turn one of your pannier bags. So it's an adapter that turns one of these little bags into a backpack. So you don't have to carry a separate backpack with you. You just buy this little adapter and it turns this bag into a backpack. So if you are thinking of bringing a, you know, a small lightweight backpack with you on your bike tour, I highly recommend you check out this product. It's made by Ortlib, which is the same company that makes these panniers. Um, and it costs about $50, I think. So probably, you know, the same price as a backpack or, um, maybe even half the price of, of a small lightweight backpack, but it, it connects to one of these pannier bags, either the front one or the back one. And then you can use, you can kind of double that bag as your backpack once you step off of your bicycle. And that's another thing that I talk about inside the blueprint and inside so many of my bicycle turn pro videos is the fact that you always want to be looking for ways to like double up your gear. You want to be, you want to have things that serve two functions, right? Like some people will bring a GPS and their smartphone on a bike tour. But in reality, your smartphone is a GPS and it has a GPS built into it. So you don't need to bring a GPS and a smartphone, right? Like, so that's just like one example of how you can eliminate an item, get rid of the dedicated GPS and just use your smartphone instead. Uh, you'll save a lot of weight. You'll save, you have one less device that you have to power, et cetera, et cetera. And the same is true with the, with the backpack adapter that I'm talking about uh, in the Bicycle Touring Pro store. You just buy this little adapter and then it converts your pannier bag into a backpack rather than you having to carry a separate backpack with you. If you're interested in that product, it's in the Bike Tour uh, shop. It's biketourshop.com or, or bicycletouringpro.com forward slash shop. Um, somebody just asked about my shirt. I mentioned it at the beginning. This is the Bicycle Turn Pro fully loaded t-shirt. This is a shirt that I made for Bicycle Turn Pro. I just kind of made it for myself, really. Um, and, but it's for sale in the Bicycle Turn Pro shop. It's on, it's printed on a really like comfortable, it's tri-blend. It's a tri-blend t-shirt. So it's not hundred percent cotton. It's something else, but it's very comfortable. Um, and this is the most popular one in the shop, but there are several other bike related shirts in there. So I highly encourage you to check those out. Once again, biketourshop.com or bicycletrainpro.com forward slash shop. Um, Donna says Altura panniers also have an adapter strap. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with that particular one, but, but yeah, many panniers have like a shoulder strap. That you can use so like if you don't want to carry a backpack and you just want to use your pannier as like a, a shoulder bag um, a lot of the panniers out there um, come with that shoulder strap but very few uh, pannier brands have that backpack adapter and ortlib is one of them um, and ortlib is the brand that i kind of use and recommend uh oh i've lost your guys comments i'm trying to get them back where'd they go oh there they are uh <laughs> have you thought about trying to speed up answers so more questions can be answered sorry i'm just trying to answer these questions fully uh darren i'm gonna have yeah is the cotton good quality yeah it's it's a good quality shirt i i searched around for a long time trying to find the best quality shirts they're not cheap uh you know t-shirts where am i at the moment i'm at home, my home in park city utah um, go back and watch this from the beginning and I'll tell you the whole story about my, where I am right now. Uh, someone says, I use a recumbent bike for my long tours because of the strain on my cervical spine and all the other parts of my body, which started to hurt is greatly reduced. Yeah. Um, you know, these, these recumbent bicycles are not super popular. Like I don't see very many people out riding them, but I do hear from people saying that they do ride them. I think the problem with recumbents is that a lot of the people that get them usually just end up doing local tours and not like super long distance tours, although there are obvious exceptions for that. 
Um, but, but yeah, I have spent 20 years cycling around the world and I've like literally never seen someone riding a recumbent bicycle on a long distance bike tour. They were always just doing local rides in their area. So yeah, if you do have back problems, a recumbent is certainly something to look into. And there are recumbents out there that have been designed specifically, uh, with bicycle touring in mind. Ron says, do you plan on doing a tour in the Midwest anytime soon? I don't have plans for anything there at the moment. Um, I'm probably going to be staying here in Utah, Colorado, Idaho, Wyoming, etc. for this year, but who knows? Uh, we'll see. Ben says, what do you think about fanny packs for touring? As bad as backpacks? I've never worn a fanny pack in my entire life, um, so I don't know, but I, I would have a, I would have, I think it might be a problem just leaning over because of where it is in your stomach, you know what I mean? You're going to be hitting, what, I don't know why you would need a fanny pack. I think it's a much better idea to have a handlebar bag, um, and, I, and I sell handlebar bags again in the bike tour shop. Let me show you the one I use and recommend here. Um... This is, this is the one that I use, and this is the Ortlib, I think it's called the Ultimate 6 Handlebar Bag. And um, it's big enough to hold a DSLR camera, pretty much anything you would need to access food, a jacket, a uh, camera, smartphone. I, I put in these little side pockets, I put my multi-tool, chapstick, I have a knife in here that I use for cooking food. You could also use it to defend yourself if you had to. Um, I put my tire levers, my patch kit on this side. Um, I also carry um, some spare rack screws and like my, yeah, you know, just like some little uh, extra washers and things like that. All of that goes inside my handlebar bag. But basically, if there is an item that I want to access while I am out on the road, I want to have it in my handlebar bag. I don't want to have it in one of my pannier bags because getting into those bags while you're riding your bike is basically impossible. So if you, you know, this bag allows you, there's just a little strap here, you pull up on it, the top of the bag opens up and you can access whatever's inside very, very easily. And then as you're riding, this just snaps back down into place. There are two little magnets on the back that hold the top of the uh, bag in place and this is a waterproof fully waterproof bag so you can put your electronics in here and and not worry about them getting wet so this is the sort of thing that i would recommend using um, and they come in different sizes but this size i think is a good one it's not the biggest handlebar bag out there in the world and it's definitely not the smallest it's kind of it's kind of on the large side but not so large that like it's weighing your bike down or something like that. So instead of a fanny pack, I would recommend going with something like this. What else? Uh, <laughs> someone says you keep your gun in a handlebar bag. Nope. Never had a gun on any of my bike tours. Never needed a gun on any of my bike tours. Um, I have carried like bear spray, pepper spray, and never had a need for that either. Um, but, but that's like one of those things, uh, it's kind of depends where you're touring in the world. Like if you're in America, maybe you can actually cycle across America with a gun in your possession, but in so many other parts of the world, it is illegal to have a gun. So you got to do your research, um, before you do that. And, and in all honesty, I would say like, you probably will never need a gun, but you know, there are horror stories out there. So, um, that's, that's up to you. I, I have no opinion really on that matter. I know that, I, you know, I've spent 20 years cycling around the world. I've been to some pretty dangerous parts of the world. I've, um, I rode through gang ridden towns in Africa where people were openly carrying assault rifles and all kinds of weapons. Um, I've had people stop me uh, in the Amazon rainforest in South America, you know, they had the, the 10 people holding a chain across the road demanding money from me. I've had uh, people chase me with machetes and stuff. So I'm aware of the fact that bad things do happen. But 
I don't want to like scare people into thinking that you leave your house and you need a gun or something. It's, most of the world is very, very safe. People are friendly. They're going to be curious about your travels. And as long as you are smart and kind of like aware of your surroundings, you should be generally okay. So um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, Lawrence says, Darren, would you ever envision using an e E tour bike if say you had injuries that made big hills a lot harder and what do you think of them in general in relation to touring thanks yeah so this is a common question that i've been getting a lot lately and frankly i think e-bikes are fine uh i have no problem whatsoever with e-bikes the the only problem with e-bikes is that you are limited to charging them up you know where you can charge them up so if you choose to use an e-bike on a long distance bike tour, you are essentially choosing to pay to stay in a hotel or a campground every night where you can then charge up your bicycle. So you may not be able to camp, you know, wild camp in the way that you have seen me and so many others do on their bicycle tours. Um, that's probably the biggest downside to using an e-bike is that you have to regularly charge it. Um, and depending on the bike you use, you may not even be able to get through a single day uh, off of a single charge. So um, you're going to have to pick your route very carefully. You're going to have to pick your accommodations very carefully. You may end up paying more money overall for your bike tour because you're going to have to pay for hotels, campgrounds, or extra electricity at campgrounds. Those are the things to keep in mind. But otherwise, I don't think there's any problem personally with using an e-bike. I think, you know, there's people out there that think using an e-bike is cheating or something. I I don't view bicycle touring as um, a competition. You know, I think it's, it's something you do for fun. It's something you do for your own enjoyment. Um, some people do it as a challenge to themselves. There's so many reasons people go bicycle touring and I wouldn't want to poo poo someone that chooses to use an electric bike, especially if they're using the bike um, because of some like health related injury or, you know, they're older, they, their knees are bad. They need that little bit of extra help to get up those hills. I think that's totally fine. So um, you are never going to hear a, a bad word from me about e-bikes. But like I said, um, you just need to plan your bike tour more, uh, more, diligently if you choose to use an e-bike all right any other questions um someone's saying all the borders are not yet open in europe yeah i mean that's that's the, that's the issue right now in the world of bicycle terrain is you know when will the world open up in the way that it was previously uh, we don't know you know it could be uh, uh next month uh, things are opening up here in the united states like stores are starting to open but Still, I, I would say that here in town, like where I live, 80% of the people are wearing masks. Um, you know, some stores you can't even go into without wearing a mask. Um, and I think this is going to continue for quite some time, this mentality um, that germs are an issue. It's so funny to me because, like, I've spent a lot of time traveling in, in Asia where masks uh, are quite common, not only just you know, in people walking around town, but also in people um, out cycling and stuff. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I spent two months cycling in Taiwan, and it was very, very common to see people riding their bikes in a full set, uh, you know, full face masks, full arm warmers, leg warmers, everything kind of covered head to toe, even though it was like 90 degrees outside. Um, and it was very normal to go into shops and see men and women and children wearing masks um, I've been to China, uh, took the subway in China. I think 95% of the people there were wearing masks. So um, is that the way the rest of the world is going to be forever in the future? I don't think forever, but I do think we're going to see a lot of people wearing masks for a long time uh, from here on out. Um, and how cycling is going to be affected, how worldwide cycling is going to be affected, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, I hope there are there are aspects of this that I personally 
enjoy. Like, I kind of like the whole six foot apart thing. I, you know, I've always kind of thought people stood too close to me in the, you know, when I'm in line at the airport or the post office or whatever. So uh, I would love it if that whole six foot thing continued forever. Um, but the face mask thing and the germ thing and all of that, some of that, um, I think will slowly go away as time goes on. What else? Um, my battery is about to die here on my phone, so I can't talk for too much long. Ken is asking about stealth camping. Ken, I have a video on my Bicycle Turning Pro website. Uh, I think it's called 50 Tips for Stealth Camping or something like that. It's also on my, yeah, it's on my website. It's on my YouTube channel. Um, I highly recommend you check that out. I am like the king of stealth camping. I do it all the time. I probably stealth camp more than I stay in regular campsites, um, stealth or wild camp, depending on what you want to call it. And I recommend you check out that article. My best tips for stealth camping are in that article slash video. Um, merci, merci. How, how did you feel when that dog punched one of your backpacks? Weren't you scared? Yeah, so in one of my videos, I think I was in Romania, I had a, a group of dogs actually kind of chase me down the road, and one of them bit into the side of my pannier bag and and was like pulling on, like their whole body weight on the side of my bike. Uh, was I scared? No, not really, because um, I've had like thousands of dogs <laughs> chase after me <laughs> all around the world, so I wasn't super scared. Um, but I was kind of upset because that dog did actually bite a hole in the side of my brand new waterproof panniers. Luckily, he didn't bite a hole in the main part of the bag. He, bought, he bit a hole in the side pocket. So it wasn't such a big deal. But, um, but yeah, I mean, in 20 years of cycling around the world, I've had thousands of dogs chase after me on my bike. And I know that dogs dogs are an issue that some people are very concerned about but for me I've never really been scared of dogs um I think you know probably if you're if you're already afraid of dogs then yes having dogs chase you on your bicycle could be very very scary I'm just not afraid of dogs in general so I guess it's not that scary for me to have a couple dogs chase after me as I'm traveling on my bike in 20 years, I've had two dogs bite, not me, but my pannier bags. They're usually going after my bags on the bike and not actually me myself. Or, they, or you know, I, I have had dogs kind of obsess with my foot on the pedal. They're looking at my foot on the pedal and they're chasing that my foot with their head. Um, so maybe you do want to watch your feet a little bit, but otherwise, um, you know, spraying the dog with your water bottle is a good strategy and usually most dogs will just give up on you once you pe pedal out of their general area you know dogs are pretty territorial so um, if you cycle out of their yard or their street or whatever um, they'll give up on you and turn around and go back so I think um, one of the big dangers with dogs is these wild dogs that you'll see in some parts of the world um, I, I've certainly run into them in South America. I've certainly run into them um, in Eastern Europe. Um, I, I found the dogs in Asia to be much better behaved for some reason. Um, and I haven't really had dog problems in Africa. But um, in, in those situations, it's usually not one dog that's the danger. It's The danger is if you encounter a big pack of dogs that's when you really got to be careful because those packs of dogs um are what can actually cause you some pretty severe damage um okay guys i can't talk uh much longer my battery is about to die so i just want to say thank you so much for tuning in uh once again if you want to pick up a copy of my book the bicycle train blueprint this is the book that's going to help you plan prepare for and execute your dream bike tour anywhere in the world if you want to buy this sh shirt or this coffee cup or this handlebar bag or any of the racks or pannier bags that i recommend and actually use on my own bicycle touring adventures all the gear that i use on my own bikes all of that 
is on my website at bicycletrainpro.com forward slash shop. It's also at biketourshop.com. So I highly encourage you to check it out. And even though the future of bike travel is kind of up in the air at the moment, I do hope that I see all of you out on the road sometime soon. So thank you once again for tuning in. I hope you have a great day and I will talk to you later. All right, guys, that's it. I'm Darren Elf from BicycleTrainPro.com. Thanks for watching and uh, have a good one. Thanks so much. Bye. I'm still here. I'm still waving. Okay. Am I ready to end the stream? Yes. Yes, I am. Okay. Talk to you guys later. Bye.